He's our Savior. He's our healer. He's the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and our soon coming King. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Welcome to the Church on the Way. For the next hour, we invite you to lift up the name of Jesus with us, praising Him and glorifying Him. Our teacher is Pastor Jack Hayford, author, composer, and pastor of the Church on the Way in Los Angeles, California. Today, Pastor Jack will be instructing us from God's eternal word and will be ministering to one another in prayer. Now, let's join in worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. crowning of the Lord as Lord of all is something that is expressed in so many ways. There is the appropriate uh, inaugural exercise at the time a person is invested with authority when the crown is put upon their head. That has been done by the Lord Jesus already. The Bible says we come and take our crowns and put them at his feet. The essence of that picture is a humbling of ourselves and acknowledging that all that we have flows from him. 
And I want to invite you this morning to, as an act of bold humility, that seems like a paradox in terms, an act of bold humility to lift your voice in assertive, declarative praise to the Lord. No one's going to go ape bonkers or fly off the wall someplace. We're not going to lapse into some fanatical exercise. I'm going to ask you to do the most logical thing in the world, but it does require humbling yourself for most of us. By nature, I would retire from such an expression. It's something I would withdraw from, I suppose, because there's a natural shyness many of us feel, also because you never want to be mistaken as though you were among those who are simply stampeded and manipulated into idiocy of some fanatical demonstration. I want you as an act of humble assertiveness and boldness. Declare the praise of the Lord. The Bible speaks of high praise as being just as appropriate as worship or praise that is offered in silence and tenderness. Let us come with assertive declaration and boldness and lift up the name of Jesus, the high praise of God. How many of you would join me in that this morning? Would you just lift your hand, put the other one with it, and let's lift up our voices loudly and praise the Lord. <clears throat> Holy Father, we declare your magnificence this morning. We say let the mountains re-echo with the glory of the name of the Lord God, you who created us with the breadth of the spectrum of expression, from silent and ten to tender song to boldness of a shout unto our God. We declare you are worthy, O Lord, and we magnify your name and fill this house with the name of the Lord. Abide among us in glory, O Lord. Ride among us in triumph. Manifest the strong arm of your power and overthrow your enemies. Lord, let all who declare your righteous cause in shouting amen and praise to the name of the Lord rejoice marvelously in your name. Hallelujah. We praise and adore the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. O Lord, it's beautiful. Holy Father, we assemble our voices boldly declaring your majesty. But in that bold declaration, we not only rise to salute you and to pledge our allegiance to our King with high praise, we also would come and reverently humble ourselves before your feet, dear Lord Jesus. We read in your word how beautiful is the place of your feet, where your throne and authority have been established, and we come to your feet. Jesus. We come there because at that place you have willed that there would flow forgiveness, there would flow grace and healing, there would flow strength for the weary. We come to you, dear Savior, at your feet for the flow of your life to engulf and encompass ours. We come also, Lord, that from your feet we may look upon your face and be transformed as we look upon you.
as the freeing spirit of Christ is in our midst, that we would be transformed from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord, as we bow at your feet, Lord Jesus. And so, with deep thanksgiving for the joyous privilege of assembling as we do today, in the freedom we do today, and before the Lord of Lords, our King, today, we come and we declare all praise to you, precious Jesus. Move among us now, Holy Spirit, and let there come the application of all the truth you would speak to us by the revelation of the Scriptures. Holy Spirit, let there come with that application a very clear pathway of implementing in experience what it is that we're to live out in the days ahead by reason of these hours together. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Good morning. As we come together today, I'm mindful of that verse in the Psalms that says that, that praise is becoming to the upright or to those that worship the Lord. That uh, word in the Hebrew language conveys the idea of, a, of an actual transformation of your countenance. The essence of the idea is that people who praise the Lord begin to take on His attributes, His characteristics, and it begins to show in their face. Translated into more simple terms, Praise will make you better looking than you are. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the reasons. It's certainly not the primary one. The Lord's worthy of praise for better reasons than this. But one reason I need to praise Him is because it makes you better looking. <laughs> and I'm, I'm working on it, folks. I, I want to invite you this morning as we've gathered to worship and to adore Him, to at His feet look upon His face, for us to come together in the light of that truth, greeting one another, would you look at those who, there's people around you. How many of you have ever known anybody who as they began to grow in Christ and His likeness show in them that they began to become, they actually began to become better looking? How many have known anybody? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> While you greet this morning, I'd like to ask you to say to people you greet, look at them full in the face and say, you must praise God a lot. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them that, greet them. Welcome to the Church on the Way. The power of the Lord is not only something that reaches in to invade our problems, but it's a power that progressively transforms us. The beauty of the Lord about which we've just spoken is a very real and lovely thing. And when we speak about His loveliness is one thing. To have Him transmit that loveliness into our lives is another. Let's open to both happening today as we worship at the Church on the Way. We're singing it's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's His glory in the church. Let's sing about it. Don't wait. Come on. Would you take your bulletins with me and shall we sing a glorious church?
as I awakened this morning, there came a very stirring, enlivening touch of the Lord to my own heart and mind. And I, I sensed the Holy Spirit giving me a word for us today. And I was thinking, Lord, I understand what it is you're giving me for the comfort and encouragement of the body, but I, I don't really know how to fit it into the service. And I was seated in the first service and we began singing this song and came to verse 3 and 4, and I hardly can describe to you the confirming sense of confidence that came that indeed the Lord was wanting to say this very thing to the body and already had begun to establish it in the words of our own singing as we have declared the lyrics of this hymn. I'd like for you to look to verse 3 and 4 with me for just a moment, and then I want to share with you something that I believe the Holy Spirit is seeking to say to, to whomever this morning needs this, this word of comfort and upbuilding. But look with me at verse 3 and 4. Never fear the clouds of sorrow. Never fear the storms of sin. We shall triumph on the morrow. Even now our joys begin. Wave the banner. Shout his praises, for our victory is nigh or near at hand. We shall join our conquering Savior. We shall reign with him on high. Loved ones, the word of the Lord to us today is don't fear. Don't fear. So strongly, the Holy Spirit prompted me this morning that there would be assembling today a significant number who are in one way or another tormented or assaulted by the spirit of fear. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear. Anytime fear begins to grip your heart by whatever expression, it can be all the way from things you feel intimidated about, you feel inadequate before, you feel incapable, or you feel absolutely terrified. Panic or horror has beset you. There are imaginations that come to the mind, prospects that linger from dreams, things that you say, I wonder if that is a forecast of a horrible destiny for me. It can be something that you accept as a lie from hell. God has not given us the spirit of fear. The first word of the Lord today is, I didn't give you that fear. The fear of the Lord, the reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom. But the fear of man, the fear of circumstance, is something the enemy takes and by demon spirits plagues the mind, torments the soul. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Say those words with me, will you? God has not given us the spirit of fear. I recently had a friend of mine note in an article that he had written something that I trusted his scholarship to be so. I have not been able to find all the references he claims he has found. Perhaps he's just quoting someone else. So I cannot vouch for certain this as yet, for I have only found some hundreds, not all 365 that he said are present. But I'm going to take his word for it, because I know there are at the very least hundreds, and that's enough anyway, over 200. He said that he had found 365 places in the Bible where in one way or another it says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. 365, he said, isn't it interesting that there appears to be in the Scripture the same number of injunctions to not fear as there are days in the years of our life. It's as though God said, I want you to take for every day a reminder, don't be afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. The promise of the Lord's presence, even in the face of terminal circumstances, is something that says, don't fear over that. Because I have made the Lord my refuge, the Scripture says, I will not fear what man shall do. The confidence of the Lord's presence and power. Loved ones, the Lord is wanting to say to you today, don't you fear what it is that comes as a cloud and seeks to shadow your way. 
lift up your face. He says, behold the Lord and glorify him. The radiance, the Lord says by his spirit, of the light of his triumph beaming upon your countenance shall reflect upon the cloud that comes and seeks to discourage you and shall burn it away. And you shall see all the more clearly the way of the victory that I have for you. I wonder how many there are that say, I needed a prompting like that from the Spirit of God today. Did you? Would you read the words that are above this uh, title, The Prayer Awakening of the Church on the Way? Read with me from Isaiah 11:11. 11, 11. Will you please? It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. <clears throat> I do not have to feign emotion when I read these words these days. This morning, I want you to see these words and to hear the shepherd's heart because the implications of, of those words are more than just that they touch me. They're words that I know the sheep of this flock need to hear with a hearing ear. It's a remarkable thing to experience in your lifetime as, as many of us have been privileged to, to experience a mighty wave of God's revival and renewing blessing. It's, it's, a, it's a, a joy to live in a time that God has moved with power. That has occurred marvelously and graciously because it is God that has done it and not man's wisdom or accomplishment that has begotten it. That has occurred at this church and been sustained for many years. Over the past months, in an ever-deepening way, the Holy Spirit has been crowding toward a point of focus and a promise. The point of focus is prayer. The promise is God's full preparedness and his will to do a second manifestation of his power and his glory, not only in our church, but I believe it's something he's setting himself to do in the whole body of Christ for the sake of a globe-wide surge of power. Now, I realize that those kind of words can sound like a kind of just shop talk that is designed to inspire with no real guarantee of uh, anything else than that someone was enthused about the idea. But dear ones, I say to you with all the sobriety and with all the, the joyous faith that I can express, Sobriety, because I, I want us to feel the weight and the gravity of it. Joy, because I have no question it's so. And I feel the certainty of the Lord's Word and its confirmation by, by many, many witnesses in our travels, what we hear the Lord saying to many across the face of this planet and what he is clearly doing in numberless ways. The Lord is setting his hand to do a new and mighty thing. I haven't the definition of how it shall manifest. I have the insurance, the confidence that we stand on the brink of God's breakthrough grace. And it'll make a difference in you. It'll make a difference in your family. It'll make a difference in your business. It'll make a difference in our town. It'll make a difference if you not married with family, it'll make a difference in your relationships. And the difference will be more than just a change. The difference will be glorious. It's a glorious church. The Lord's doing something of glory at a new dimension. And so the words of Isaiah the prophet speak to us. For the Lord said in that day, I will set my hand again a second time. I would like for you to recognize with me that the way you reach up and lay hold of his hand that is reaching a second time to do a new dimension of work, the way you set yourself to reach and take hold of his hand is on your knees in a new stance of prayer. 
a new posturing of your own soul, an availability of your heart to prayer. But I believe that we're setting on a course that the Lord is saying, I want you to walk this way as you move toward the climax of this century and of this millennium. It's not as though we were for poetic or sentimental reasons pointing to the year 2000 as though there were magic in that number. But it certainly does have a way of getting our attention that we do live in a climactic season of history, not just because the calendars are closing out in the way they are, but because everywhere we look, we live in a world that appears to be closing out. There seems to be a countdown on our culture, a countdown by reason of the violence, the urban decadence, the problems that seem insoluble at so many dimensions of government around the world, the crisis in family in our own society, the plague of AIDS that continues to expand unchecked by any success of medical science. Wherever you turn, one thing after another tells us we live in crucial times. And we either may take the posture of passivity and say, well, thank God I'm saved. The world is going down the drain, but I'm going up when Jesus comes, and let it go on that. Or we can take the position that Jesus taught. He said, until I come again, and the essence of what he said was, it isn't your business to try and figure out the prophetic analysis that will tell you when I come back. Your job is to occupy till I come. And that occupational force of the living church is not intended to passively stand and either uh, merely live on survival rations for our own life or succumb to the circumstances of the times without there being a contending in faith, the believing God is able to work great turnaround by his spirit. And the word of the Lord is saying, it's come to pass in that day, I will set my hand again the second time. And we're committed to moving in prayer to discovering what happens when a group of people, anyone who will, says, Lord, in prayer we reach up to be taken hold of by your hand setting to do something new at this time and to move into wherever your hand leads us with that. Let us all move in prayer as we come to this answer to God's word who says he'll set his hand again the second time. Debbie Boone Ferrer has just released uh, an album which uh, she and Gabri sent me. And uh, I play it all the time in the, in the car. I, I travel with this. I was listening to it on the way to church this morning. When Steve Green's album three or four years ago on the uh, grandeur of God came out, I, I did a similar thing. Steve's not in our congregation, so it's not really, it has to do with weight and substance. There are so many marvelous contemporary songs and contemporary artists that it's very difficult to make a choice among all of them as to which you enjoy most, and there's some very creative lyrics. And on occasion, you encounter some that will probably endure the test of time. But we virtually never receive albums today in which everything on that album has proven through the test of time to be an enduring contribution to the life of believers. This album, titled Be Thou My Vision, is a, an album of music that is comprised of hymns, songs that have endured, some over recent generations, some over the centuries. You know a number of them. It's not that they're novel and new. It's that there's not only magnificent arrangements by Ron Huff, but that there is something that flows out of Debbie's ministry of them that I believe contributes to the kind of thing I hear the Holy Spirit calling all of us unto. And that's to a new dimension of depth and strength in Christ. I would like to ask you this morning, without applause, with nothing else than simply the warmth of the readiness of your heart to receive ministry, to receive Debbie as she comes, but receive her as a minister of the grace of Jesus to our hearts. I've asked her to minister a pair of songs from the album. I said, Debbie, I'd like to pick one. I really wanted to pick two. <laughs> and I said, I'll pick one and you pick one. Can you imagine my delight when I discovered her choice was the other one I wanted? 
which indicates that she is a very discerning young woman. <laughs> Would you just let your heart be prepared? As a matter of fact, let us, as she comes, fix our eyes and hearts on Jesus as she ministers in song to us. Just open your heart with your hands, with your soul. Debbie, would you come? It has been completely inspirational and devotional to have had the privilege of doing a hymns album and just awakening to the truth and the, the spirit behind these great hymns. I was raised on them, but I didn't always love them. I found them kind of threatening and unrelatable. And words like trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, I found kind of frightening and almost like a spanking, and I felt like I'm not a good enough girl for God. But thank God he is transforming me and showing me more about his character and his love and everything that he has already taken care of so that I don't have to concentrate so much on myself and my own shortcomings and that will only separate me from his love. But when I come to know him, which I do even more every time I read the words of these hymns, when I concentrate on the beauty of the Lord and ask him to reveal himself and what he's really like, I fall so in love with him that I don't worry anymore that I may fall short, but that he's bigger than all of my shortcomings and that I can run to him always and know that he's there accepting me, loving me, and making me to be everything that he created me to be. He gave me a word in the first service 
just an illustration. I particularly have never liked songs that, that really depict visually the crucifixion of Jesus because I would feel shame that I am not giving him back everything that he's given me. But now, because of a deeper work in my heart and Jesus showing me how much he absolutely loves me, I can look on songs like these and hear the words and feel his love and his grace and his mercy. And I'm changed by it and I'm falling more in love with my Lord every day. And the illustration the Lord gave me about it this morning is tomorrow I leave for a week for a anniversary vacation with my husband, 10 year anniversary. And the Lord reminded me that before I committed to engagement with Gabri, I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to make a strong commitment, that I wouldn't be faithful to my commitment because I didn't trust myself. I trusted him and I thought he was such a wonderful guy, but I didn't trust my own ability to make that serious a commitment. And it was Gabri's love towards me, his commitment to me, his forgiveness when I fell short, and his commitment to our relationship together that made me forget about myself and realize what a wonderful guy I could actually live with the rest of my life. And 10 years after marriage, I have had the most wonderful, happy life with him. And Jesus has shown me now how to approach him that same way, quit looking at myself and learn who he is and I'll be so in love with him that I'll never have to fear my own infidelity to my Lord. And I, with that, I sing this next song. Oh, sacred head, now wounded with grief. Say it with me, will you? Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for you. Sing with me, will you? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to
Thank you, Debbie. Let's open our Bibles together, shall we, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. <clears throat> but the message already has been begun, both in the testimony of song in which there is the pointing to the timeless beauty of the Savior as we seek His face, and at the beginning of the day, His day, which isn't just each morning, but the Lord brings new days, new times, new seasons. At that time, as we seek His face, He shows His grace. And secondly, Debbie's remarks about the transforming power of a right relationship and how that helped her perspective on the Lord. This morning was to have been part two of a three-week series. It is the beginning of part two, but the series will continue possibly longer than I even am ready to project because the more I examine this passage and sense the Holy Spirit's desire that our perspective on our own, each of us, our role as leaders, as much as the Lord wants us to see, I believe, a clear perspective on our collective and individual role as leaders, leading people out of the darkness of the world into the light and life of Jesus. And then as leaders within the body of Christ, charged with assignments to be faithful to Jesus' standards for leadership. I think perspective on that will be a very, very good thing for us. Do us well to take longer than we planned. This morning, I present to you just a beginning of the thoughts that were to originally have comprised this message. In the third chapter of 1 Timothy, the text we read of the first 13 verses of that chapter last week divides into two sections, the description of the requirements of the office of a bishop, and we discussed that that is the same as the role of an elder, and it's also the requirements of pastors leadership in the church, that dimension of leadership. Then deacons, those who serve, who are engaged in special aspects of ministry in the body of Christ, not as formal, professionally called ministers, but uh, people who, irrespective of vocation, minister the life of Jesus and do it in a way that is specifically acknowledged in the body life of a congregation. The Bible specifies requirements of character, conduct, and specifically of their family life. It's an interesting fact that in this passage, and I am not rereading it this morning, for we read the text already this past week, and you can review it, verses 1 through 13, presents in 13 verses, 11 of which are giving specifications of requirements. In 11 verses, then, it gives four and a half of those, very close to half of the whole passage is given to just two of a list of 22 different character traits, 15 that are expected of bishops, or that is elders and pastors, and seven that are expected of deacons. Of these 22 traits that are discussed, two of them are repeated for both to accept as requirements, and those two occupy at least a third and close to a half of all the words as it elaborates those two requirements. Let me read them to you in those, those two. In verse 2, it says, the husband of one wife, going to verse 4, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And then down in the qualifications of a deacon, the Bible says in verse 11 concerning the deacons, likewise their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. A little over four verses of the 11 listing 22 guidelines and requirements points to the importance of the husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, and the abiding atmosphere of the home as essential qualifications for leadership in the body of Christ. I want to talk about why that's the case, just briefly. And then I want us to look at it with hope as we will pursue this further in our next time to open this passage of Scripture. 
For I remind you, we are not merely going through a recitation of the requirements of people who are designated leaders apart from the rest of the body. We're looking at something that the Lord demonstrates to all of us that we might all see a possibility for all of our lives. For no one who leads has a superior claim on God's grace. What he offers to one, he offers to all. And the power with which he works some grace of development and maturity and love and health and relationships in one life, that same power is at the disposal of every other person. The reason the Lord has laid such emphasis on these two aspects of relationship, husband-wife relationship, parent-child relationship, I think is probably obvious to us all. Since the fall of man, that family, and human relationships have been in complete disarray. The first thing that happened with the fall of man is Adam and Eve take the leaves and begin to cover themselves. And our tendency and our human uneasiness with our nakedness, think of it as having to do with nudity and covering the nudity. Whatever the implications of that practical wisdom may be, that's not the point of the text. The issue is that there was a lost sense of kinship and unity and relationship, and they felt embarrassed around one another, and there was a distancing of themselves from one another. The first thing that happens when God arrives on the scene, God says, what happened here? Adam says, the woman you gave me. He begins by blaming her when he was the one that was charged with the initial assignment to provide protective leadership, the woman you gave me. The next chapter before you've gone 30 verses in the Bible, Cain kills Abel. And so we move into sibling rivalries. We ro move into lost control in families. We move into relationships beginning to distance and blame being registered. The fall of man manifests in damaged relationships and all kinds of confusion in the family. We're not talking about family crisis in our generation. It's been in every generation. The more that you deal in counsel with dear and precious souls, and as the years accumulate, and now decades begin to accumulate in my own ministry, I become more keenly aware all the time of the frightening impact that every personality bears on the accumulated toll of failure from out of their past. Not that it exempts us from responsibility for our own failures, but that it does explain our inclinations. And how many are the things we don't know that we have inherited? And how many of the things that we shall pass on as an unfortunate heritage of our own failure to our own? Except, except, except God by His grace do something in us. And so Jesus coming into the world has not only come to save our souls from sin and give us eternal life individually with the hope of heaven, He's come to establish in the life of the church the hope for enduring relationships, fulfilling relationships, happy homes, husbands and wives who are committed to one another, joyous in their life together, kids who understand what they're about because they're raised in the security of their being disciplined that is not tyrannical or some kind of authoritarian beat the kid into a bloody pulp and turn them into some kind of craving, obedient uh, creature who doesn't understand how to think for themselves or on the other hand, becomes a promiscuous, arrogant little, if you'll forgive the word snot, because nobody ever disciplined them and trained them in what it meant to be accountable to other people. We go to one extreme or the other, by and large, and the Lord has said in His Word, I want to raise up leadership in my church. First, those who lead, who occupy the office, we who pastor, and those who move into eldership do. I want them to model, not because they strut it before others, but simply that they stand simply and humbly as evidence that God's grace can make a husband-wife relationship work and kids be raised in the way of God and be happy and whole and balanced and not religious, but real and sensible. And for also that to so impact the body life of congregations so led that those people begin to experience the same. And as that occurs, the world will read 
the life and the love of God, the Father who is loving and yet all-powerful. And you will see what Jesus is like because it sees church leaders who love the flock and yet lead with authority. The reason that the Lord requires me to have a right relationship with Anna if I am to lead you is because he knows that whatever is true of our relationship, no matter how you trim it, is going to filter down by a trickle-down effect upon all of you. I will not treat the bride of Christ any differently than I will treat my own. And that's true of every person who leads. And so the Lord says, I expect those who lead to lead with grace and understanding as their own relationship matures. I will never model any more in leading the people of God. I will never more model the love of God and his authority and balance than I'm able to learn how to raise my kids understanding the love of a father, but a father who draws very clear lines and requires obedience but gives the instruction the child can respond to with understanding and grow in response rather than simply becoming a machine who grinds out obedience and then at first chance of bolting the coop does so. The Lord, in his word, requires very much of leadership because what transmits through that leadership represents him. But more than represents him, it begets hope and faith in those who are so led of what can happen in them and be fulfilled in their own dreams of finding recovery from whatever damage may have been the case of their experience, for we live in a very damaged world, relationally speaking. I get letters like this often, one very recently. The first part sounds like it was a letter about me or about Anna and myself. It wasn't really. It was nice. She said, Pastor Jack, I'm so glad for your leadership. But then the, le the young woman said, why? single woman in our congregation. She said, because the teaching of the Word of God is begetting people like, and then she named a couple in our church, been a part of our congregation about 15 years, came when they were in their late 20s, have raised their family, kids still growing up in our church. And she went on a long time talking about the beauty and quality of this married couple, what they show and the way they're they parent their children the way they love one another, the way they manage their life, everything about them. Now, that couple is not perfect by any means. They wouldn't claim to be, and this woman had no illusions, this single woman talking about them. But here's what she said as she finished talking about the, the loveliness. She said, coming from the background that I do, she said, I hardly can describe the hope that it gives me for my not only having eventually a relationship that will answer to the pain of my past and be healing, but one that will be so fulfilling that I may be an encouragement to others as that couple are an encouragement to me. She put her finger on the nerve of why the Lord makes these requirements. Our world needs to see that life can be better, not just you can be forgiven of your sins and go to heaven, but you can have purpose in every aspect of your relationship. This morning, as we open the Word of God to that passage of Scripture and briefly discuss it. We shall be elaborating it further. But today, let us together celebrate the happy hope that because we have the kind of heavenly Father we have and the kind of heavenly husband we have in Christ, and because we live in His Word with a quest for obedience to His directives so that those who lead though none perfected, at least are committed to and beginning to manifest these qualities, that we are not only obedient to the Scripture, but we have a growing body of evidence that Jesus can recuperate in our lives the impact of the fall of man, having forgiven our sins to bring us unto purpose in life's most important facets, and that's relationships, marriage, relationship to your brothers and sisters in Christ and in your blood family, relationships with those both within and without the faith, 
but we walk as evidences of Christ's life. That's what a representative does, presents evidence. I recently had to have a matter handled by an attorney, and he took the things that concerned me and presented them. He stood as a substitute for me, presenting the evidence. I bore the cost of it. I bore the cost of first paying him his appropriate fee, and I also bore the cost of what the liability would be if he did his job well or not. He did it well, and I was benefited thereby. Jesus had said to you and me, you are my representative, and what you present will be evidence for the case of what I'm really about. I've borne the cost to free you to present positive evidence, but he says, I also bear the liability if you don't. So be my representative. So we go in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that by the ministry of your Holy Spirit that the word be sealed to us once again, and let us with wisdom walk in the light as you are in the light, Lord Jesus. And as we prayed already this day, be further transformed into your image. Amen. Do you truly want all that God has for you? Do you want to stay open and available to be used by God to make a difference in this world? Pastor Jack Hayford recently delivered a message entitled, A Passion for Fullness, dealing with truly seeking the Spirit's fullness in your life. You know, especially today, believers everywhere need to recognize and remove any hindrances that block God's working in us to do His work in these end times. A Passion for Fullness is a stirring message that will expand both your heart and your vision. A transcript of this message is yours when you write to The Church on the Way, Post Office Box 60888, Los Angeles, California, 90060. Also, when you write, if you could include a gift of support, it would be greatly appreciated. Video and audio cassettes, as always, are available of the program you just saw. Please write and refer to the number on your screen to find out how to secure them. Thank you for being with us today for The Church on the Way. Our sincere desire is to help you with your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be blessed with truly abundant life. If we can help with books or other printed material, audio or video cassettes, write to us and we'll be glad to send you information about how you can obtain these valuable tools to help you in your walk with Christ. Our address again is The Church on the Way, Post Office Box 60888, Los Angeles, California, 90060. We invite you to join us next time as we worship the Lord together at The Church on the Way.